lock the gate. You said no give me Save $1.20 and Oscar Mayer turkey bacon, only $3.99 for a 12-ounce package. Red Ripe strawberries, $4.99 for a one-pound package. Save $1.01 on Breyer's ice cream, just $7.19 for a 48-ounce tub. Hot price on Kraft shredded cheese, $3.89 for an 8-ounce package. Save $0.66 cents on Kool-Aid drink mix, only $4.99 for a 20-ounce tub. Visit our website at www.marketplace.pm for more weekly specials. Live from Bermuda Broadcasting, this is ZBN TV 9 News. You're watching Bermuda Broadcasting News. It's Tuesday, the 5th of June. I'm Diane Brewer, and thank you for joining us tonight. A former school teacher has been acquitted in magistrate's court of sexually assaulting a student more than 10 years ago. Magistrate Archibald Warner noted the defendant forcibly denied he touched the student in any way, and he said the prosecution did not provide sufficient evidence to prove their case. It was alleged the former high school teacher sexually assaulted his student on May 3, 2007 in his classroom. The complainant told the court that she was working on a class project alone with the teacher when he touched her inappropriately by massaging her neck and cradling her like a baby. The prosecution said the accused fled the jurisdiction just hours after he was made aware of the police report against him and the subsequent suspension from teaching, leaving his wife and three children behind. Prosecutors said the actions speak to a guilty mind. The defendant maintained his innocence throughout the trial, giving evidence on the stand that the reason he left the island so abruptly was due to a failing marriage. The police report made against him only made matters worse. Defense lawyer Elizabeth Christopher argued that the complainant had an obsession with the defendant and made the story up to remain close to him. She said his action in leaving the country was because he was, quote, pushed to the edge. A long extradition case ensured after the defendant left Bermuda, with the U.S. authorities handing him over last year. Magistrate Archibald Warner said the complainant's evidence must be treated with caution in the face of the defendant's denial. He rejected the suggestion that leaving the country could be inferred as guilt in this case, adding that the Crown in all circumstances must prove all evidence. Following the verdict, Ms. Christopher warned governments against extraditing individuals without sufficient reason. Prosecutors have indicated they are likely to appeal against the verdict. Jasmine Patterson reporting for Bermuda Broadcasting News. In other news, residents of Mission Road and Paget are a happier lot tonight. They're finally able to get easy access to their homes following the removal of vehicles stored there by Cardoza's garage. It's the latest move in a long-running and bitter dispute, which has even seen the Supreme Court involved. Here's Gary Moreno with more. This was the scene outside Cardoza's garage today in the latest episode of what could well be called, as the spanner turns, the ongoing saga of Cardoza versus the government. Just last month, we reported that the vehicles, which were first moved back in March, had returned. Garage owner Mark Souza telling us then that Minister David Birch had acted prematurely, taking action before the appeal of the abatement notice had been heard in the Supreme Court. Well, that changed yesterday when the courts decided to remove the stay, resulting in a repeat of what happened in March. I went to court yesterday and the uh, Court of Appeals couldn't do anything with the undertaking because it's out of the jurisdiction. Even though we received explicit instructions from the Supreme Court Justice to go to the Court of Appeals. But since that happened, I knew that last night I wouldn't be able to park on the road. And so I moved the cars. And I graciously had permission from the Evangelical Church to park on the land until Saturday. And I parked the cars until Saturday until I could move them off of there. And I came up this morning and Colonel Birch and Watson Engineering were removing my cars. And when I said it was stealing, they basically told me, go to hell. I said, hey, well, I called the police. And the police, very, very professional, sorted it out. But they were clamping and taking my cars on private property. And that's not the way to do business. Colonel David Birch, the Minister of Public Works, paid no attention to Mr. Sousa's protestations today, with police officers moving in to quell the situation, but not to the satisfaction of the garage owner. No, I'm on private property. No, no, let me tell you, this is theft. You're not here to decide what the court said. This is private property. He's removing cars on a church land that I have permission to park cars on. This is theft. You need to stop this. If you don't stop this, then you're an accomplice. Okay. Let, don't talk about the court. You need to do your job. Stop them from stealing my cars. This is wrong. I have permission from the church to be here. 
Walker taking cars without my permission. The parking of cars on Mission Road in the vicinity of the garage, as well as emissions from work being done there, have long been the cause of tension between Mr. Souza and his neighbors, and there have been occasional confrontations. The situation has prompted a number of government agencies to take regulatory action against Mr. Souza. He argues Mission Road is a private property, and as such, government has no control over it. A notion which was legally dismissed by Chief Justice Dr. Ian Kaywilly, who declared the entire length of Mission Road a public highway. This morning's events are in no way an end to the matter, though, as the parties head back to court in November. Gary Moreno, reporting for the Bermuda Broadcasting News. Coming up, we set sail aboard the Atlantic Explorer for a second trip out onto the ocean, and we'll also have all the latest weather news. Stay with us. You can count on us. For a juicy treat, tropical mangoes, $1.69 each. USDA bone and strip steak, just $16.99 per pound, saving you $2. Select varieties of Arm & Hammer laundry detergent, only $5.99 for a 50-ounce bottle. Save $0.90 cents on Minute Maid punch juices, $3.99 for a 59-ounce cart. Kingsfoot match light charcoal, only $9.99 for a 3.1-pound bag. All stores open Monday through Saturday from 7 a.m. until 10 p.m. and Sunday, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. the mirror super camp it was an awesome experience I got to meet a lot of new people and then we also learned about the eight keys of excellence keys of those keys keys of those super camp is not like other camps there's a strong focus here about looking at the options and the choices you have available to you and choosing the one that best reflects who you are I learned a lot about the way that I have to keep pushing and pressing for no matter what's going on the best thing about Super Camp, it allows you the space to truly be yourself. Anytime somebody finally came into their own presence and felt comfortable being who they were, that was a special moment for me at Super Camp. Super Camp is about exploring who you are and transforming yourself. It only gets better! We invite you to join the transformation of a generation. Welcome back. Well, most months, the research ship Atlantic Explorer leaves its home port of St. George's for at least two voyages, gathering scientific data to check on changes to the Atlantic Ocean. Last week, we heard about the scientific work carried out on board the ship. Tonight, in the second part of a two-part series about the Explorer, Hal Davis will be looking at the ship and the crew that sail her. It's fully 170 feet long and can carry more than 30 crew and scientific staff. The Atlantic Explorer sits at dock in St George's, waiting to set off on another voyage. This one will measure, among other things, ocean salinity, oxygen levels and water temperature. It's part of a series of measurements dating back to 1954, research funded by the US National Science Foundation. Including other voyages, the ship will usually spend about 160 days a year at sea. But this year, it's a bit more than that, 184 days. And as the ship's captain, Quentin Lewis, says, even in a large vessel like this, it's not always plain sailing. Our toughest weather, too, has been transits from here back to the U.S. Um, two years, two different years going to shipyard. Um, we were in 30, 35-foot seas. We were making two knots um, because all we could do was just make headway into the seas. Uh, and I didn't think we would ever get to back to the U.S. Safety drills take place every trip for the multinational crew. Seven out of the 13 this time are from the Philippines, with two scientists also aboard. The Filipino sailors work six months on with three months off, a better schedule than on many other ships. Jojo Petone is bosun on the Atlantic Explorer. He's been working on it since 2005. Yeah, I enjoy work here in the boat. Yeah, that's why I stay uh, 13 years here. I work uh, because uh, I have a contract six months on, on the boat and three months off and vacation. Yeah. So it's quite a long time away from your, your family? Uh, that's good. Uh, no problem. Uh, my family is happy and me too. Yeah. Today is just a one day voyage, a relatively easy trip for the crew with food provided in a spacious gallery. There's no need for the bunks, though some of the crew choose to sleep aboard in port to save money. But there are always reminders that this is not a normal working environment. Out on deck, the work continues, 
more equipment being prepared to take samples down to 3,400 metres. Among those helping is Gillian McGreal, a marine technician and the only woman on the crew. She has a science background, so the job is a perfect fit. I absolutely love it. It's really great. Um, it's a perfect amount of hands-on, you know, turning wrenches, and then you also learning about networks, which is completely new to me. A lot of um, troubleshooting every day. It's pretty much all troubleshooting. Um, I like working outside in the elements, and um, I really like being involved with the science still. So, an exceptionally happy crew on a ship that may be over 30 years old, but has another 10 years life in it. With the measurements for this trip all taken, the Atlantic Explorer turns for home. There'll be another voyage in two weeks or so. The crew will once more take scientists out to take samples, in the hope that such research will prompt humans to protect this vital element that dominates our globe. It's hard to exaggerate the importance of voyages like these. They provide evidence of the health or otherwise of the world's oceans, among other things. But the work of this dedicated crew will be in vain unless policymakers pay attention to what they say. It's an open question in the current climate whether that will happen or not. Howell Davis, Bermuda Broadcasting News. Thanks, Howell. Well, turning to weather now, today we saw sunshine and some showers. Here's AccuWeather with the forecast for the days ahead. AccuWeather is presented by BFNM Insurance Group. We now go to AccuWeather headquarters. The BFNM Insurance Group is pleased to bring you tonight's AccuWeather forecast. I'm AccuWeather meteorologist Brittany Boyer and well, a little bit unsettled outside today. Same goes for yesterday and going forward. We're going to keep the showers in the forecast, maybe even a couple of rumbles of thunder. But we had our cold front pass through today. Not a whole drop off or a whole large kind of drop off in temperatures here with that cold front. But it did bring all of those clouds and also those scattered showers as well. And as we continue through time here, Again, we're going to still have those showers in the forecast for the next couple of days. So you can see the last few hours here showing those spotty showers temperatures in the 70s. So not too many changes with our temperatures. Humidity right now uh, between 70 and 75 percent. Winds are out of the west at 10 to 15 knots. The water is nice and warm, sitting at 81 degrees. Waves inside the reef are between 1 and 2 feet. Outside of the reef, between 4 and 6 feet. But as we get into the overnight hours, it's actually going to be decreasing. So uh, we're looking at better conditions on the water, just not the best of forecasts here. But you know what? We still need the rainfall. Looking at the year-to-date rain, we're still about an inch and a half to two inches below where we should be for the entire uh, calendar year here. All right, for tonight, it is is mostly cloudy, a couple of showers compared to where we are right now. Temperatures not going to be moving a whole lot. We're down to 73 degrees for your overnight low. We don't have any issues out on the water as far as small craft warnings. The thunderstorm advisory has been allowed to expire. So looking at your tidal times here, we have low tide coming in at 8.04 tonight. High tide coming in just before 2.45 on Wednesday morning. And we have more of the same for our forecast as we head into Wednesday here. High temperature of 81 degrees. Degrees. So near average temperatures for your daytime high, 74 for the low. We'll have a few peaks of sunshine tomorrow, but we're still going to have lots of clouds and also those spotty showers as well. If you're doing any traveling, here's a look at your travel forecast in the Big Apple. Temperatures will be right around 70 degrees, partly sunny, 62 in Boston. Some improvement, they're only in the 50s today. Atlanta, look at this, it is hot, hot, hot. Temperatures in the 90s for Wednesday. Checking in on some of our islands here, Jamaica. Temperatures right now near 90 degrees. We do have some scattered showers in Barbados and also Trinidad. No tropical development is out there, so we are still in good shape now that we're officially into the Atlantic hurricane season. Your extended forecast, few showers around on Wednesday, Thursday. We could have some thunder out there uh, with few spotty showers. Temperatures staying in the low 80s, and then we have a drier trend. We just have to wait through the weekend. So into Friday, uh, more clouds and sunshine at times and also some spotty showers. At this point, the weekend's looking A-OK -okay with high temperatures staying in the low 80s. Enjoy it. AccuWeather was presented by BFNM Insurance Group.
The whole concept came from uh, the collaboration with BFNM and the America's Cup. The Endeavour programme is the legacy of the 35th America's Cup that was here in Bermuda in June. And we've continued the, the charity now operating in Bermuda. And going forward, we thought, what a great opportunity for children on the autism spectrum. And hence, we actually developed the No Limits programme. They really do benefit from this kind of outdoor experience, this environment. You know, just yesterday, going off the east end of Bermuda. I mean, they wouldn't have done that. Not many children in Bermuda have done that. And just them learning to take control of a, a large bit of um, transportation that they're doing at that age, and they, they may never get that opportunity. That's where you see the biggest progress is. Whether they were looking at their hand steering, you know, it's, now they're looking forward and actually looking where they're going, because they've realized, oh, I know where my hand is. I can, I can do this without looking at my hand. We are so grateful for the Endeavor program and what it has done for the students on the autism spectrum. Listen, baby, ain't no mountain high, ain't no valley low, ain't no river. Site, I was taken insulin injections. I was also taken lisinopril and a series of other medications. There are many medications that patients are on that are very helpful. If you've able to lower the blood sugar through lifestyle, decrease in sugar intake, increase activity, you don't need those medications anymore. Whereas before we thought if you have type 2 diabetes you've got it for, your rest of your, for the rest of your life and we now understand that it can be reversed. People are saying, oh gosh Ms. Wait, you look like you lost weight, what are you doing? And you just tell them you're doing the diabetes reversal program. Dr. James looked at me and he said, he said, Sister Wait, look at you. And I said, Doc, I got my sexy back. I said, Doc, I said, you know what, I can truly say that you saved my life. I invite you to take the first step on the journey of the Diabetes Reversal Program here at the Premier Health and Wellness Centre. Welcome back. Well, if there was one thing the global financial crisis exposed, it was how weak risk management was. In the decades since global regulators have rolled out dozens of new rules, compliance can be complex and costly. Enter the new and exciting world of RegTech, companies which are using technology to help firms understand, streamline, and stay compliant with new regulations. This was just one of the things Tony Waterman spoke to KPMG's Chris Steele about on the sidelines of the company's FinTech Summit. Financial institutions are grappling with a number of challenges, not least of which is the rising cost of compliance. They're struggling with increased data and they're struggling with changes in the regulation. So really the need to do something different is very clear to me. And what that is, is the use of technology. It's not always going to have to be the most advanced technology. It doesn't have to be AI. It can be very, very basic automation. But firms need to do something, and if they don't act now and start imagining how these technologies can be applied to their risk and compliance functions, I think they're going to be up against it in the future. On one hand, you have the rising regulation. On the other hand, you have some of these regulations that have been put in place that are now being rolled back. So I think about the Volcker Rule uh, in the United States right now. Does that type of flip-flopping that potentially if a new administration comes into power, the rules of the game may change, does that impede or dissuade uh, companies from investing in this type of technology? That, that uncertainty, the fact that you're not sure what rules will apply in the future, clearly impedes people are making huge investments. But my point, I guess, would be is that it doesn't need to be a huge investment. It needs to be a practical, thought-through strategy which aligns with your wider organisational strategy. So even if the regulations roll back, if you've thought about your response to compliance with regards to the rest of your transformation strategy, you kind of have a no-regrets 
actions you can take. But absolutely, I think that is holding back investment in this area. But I think it, in the same way that some areas are considering rollback, there's growth and there are new regulations coming in in other areas. That segues quite nicely into talking about multinational companies because it's become a very global world. Even small little companies uh, can have a global reach. Do you think that reg tech can actually uh, smooth out the process across borders of having different regulations in place, different penalties in place, different rules in place, or does it become somewhat of a roadblock? I think the regulators themselves appreciate that challenge. So in the UK, uh, the Financial Conduct Authority is leading the charge with trying to join up some of those regulators, those colleges. Uh, everyone talks about sandboxes, where firms can experiment in a safe environment. In the FCA, they're trying to coordinate globally and introduce a global sandbox, which I think would be a very positive thing, because now you're in a slightly strange position where there's a bit of regulatory arbitrage happening, where you have one jurisdiction saying, come to my sandbox. You know, If you're not accepted in MAS in Singapore or in the UK, you can come to my jurisdiction. So I think that's a danger. I think if that sort of regulators trying to get one up on each other continues, that's an impediment. However, I think the, as you say, the international nature of some of even these smaller businesses is a positive. And they are almost, they're, they're natives in this now. They realize those challenges. They haven't grown up with silos. Some of the bigger financial institutions who are truly international are in 50, 60 countries. They are, they are there, but they have such strong local presence they're not prepared to change. Mm. I think the startups have an advantage because they're, you know, they recognize, okay, I need to play on the global stage, I need to play cross-border, and I'm gonna gear up my business model to do that. Still to come, Earl Basin will have all the latest sports news in just a few minutes. The Marketplace Food Court is you and your family's one-stop shop. Start your day at the breakfast bar with omelets made to order and traditional Bermuda codfish breakfast. The chefs will cook lunch and dinner to your liking, along with the salad bar, sandwich bar, sushi bar and fruit bar, the Marketplace Food Court is your kitchen away from home. Every day is hassle-free with nutritious meals from the Marketplace Food Court. Visit us seven days a week. Homemade cooking, quality service, all at prices you can count on. This is Rick Blomquist of Dupere, Wisconsin. His life is pretty comfortable. He lives in a comfy home, wears comfortable shoes. He even has a comfortable job. Rick Blomquist thought he had comfort all figured out. But then he laid on a Serta and realized his life was only just sorta of comfortable. The new Serta <laughs> iComfort Hybrid Mattress. Not just sorta of comfortable, Serta of comfortable. Feel the difference a good night's sleep can make. Exclusively available at Dreams, Bermuda's only mattress gallery. JBM Realty & Associates services all your real estate needs. Our agents have years of real estate experience specializing in selling of properties, renting of properties, property management, vacation rental. So whether you're looking to move to another location, selling your home, purchasing a new home, or a landlord looking for assistance in managing your property, give us a call today. One of our experienced agents will be more than willing to assist you with all your housing needs. Call us on 234-2050 or visit our website, jbmrealtyandassociates.com. Turning to sports, a young cricketer gets the opportunity of a lifetime playing at the Oval and Raquel Evans will compete in a 2020 Olympics qualifier Earl Baisden has tonight's sports package. Yesterday we reported that Kamal Lavrock was drafted in the Canadian T20 Tournament League. Lavrock was surprised he was even drafted. I was uh, very surprised. Um, one of my mates sent me the, the link to register and I just thought to myself, uh, I guess I'll put my, um, put my name in the head to see what comes out of it. Wasn't really expecting much, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I did. And the fact that you got drawn alongside some big name players only makes it even more special. Is it something you're looking forward to now? Yeah, it is. I'm looking forward to uh, a lot. You know, there's a lot of knowledge to be gained from these, these players, these top players who have played the game for, for quite some time now. And I'm, I'm, I'm itching to get out there. Now, have you been in touch with the club to see when you would arrive and what's on the schedule? Uh, no, I haven't. I'm waiting on um, confirmation through email to see what the deal is. I do uh, have contact details for the coach, so I, I may ask him the next day or so. I'm just still trying to focus on what I have to do in Nottingham's second team. 
Marcus Scotland was one of 24 fortunate under-15 players to contest the 48th annual Hobbs Trophy featuring the best cricketers from state schools in London and Surrey. Scotland's London team would pick up an 80-run victory after scoring 211 for 7, the Surrey school scoring 131 for 7. Played at the famous Oval Cricket Ground in London and under the shadow of the iconic gas holder, opener Scotland made a brisk 13 that included a pull for 6 off fast bowler Elliot Sleep. The Bermuda Cricket Board's 50-over Cricket League season resumed this past weekend, and once again, we bring you the top performers. In the batting department, Treadwell Gibbons from the St. George's Cricket Club was the top scorer of the weekend with a knock of 107 not out. With a knock of 97, saw Alan Douglas Jr. from St. David's Cricket Club the second highest scorer, and Dejon Carey from Flats Victoria had the next highest with a knock of 82. In the bowling department, Malachi Jones from the Southampton Rangers had the best figures of 10 overs, two maidens, six for 26. Nelson Baskin had the second best figures Figures of 10 overs, 2 maidens, 4 for 21 representing Flats Victoria and Coach Sean Lipon Simmons representing Devonshire Recreation Club had the third best figures of 8 overs, 1 maiden, 4 for 24. The Finn class is delighted to have eight nations, two from Africa, two from Asia, three from Americas, including Bermuda, and one from Europe participating in the Emerging Nations program in connection with the Hempel Sailing World Championships in Arus. This sailing event is the first qualifying event for the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games. Raquel Evans would join 99 other Finn sailors in Arus. The 100 entries represent sailors from 44 nations, which is the largest number of nations represented at any class in Arus except for the laser and radial. This compares with 36 nations during the whole of the 2016 qualification cycle, though the Finn was still one of the top five classes when counting numbers of nations represented. Elon Daly was back in action competing in an age group international swim meet in Canada. Daly made nine final appearances, winning five medals, unofficially breaking three records along the way, and establishing six personal best times. Daly picked up the 50 meter freestyle gold medal when she touched the wall at a time of 26.57, breaking her own record time of 26.59. She sat back on April 3rd, 2017, during the 33rd Carifta Swimming Championships in Jamaica. During the 100 meter freestyle final, Daly won the gold medal with a time of 58.41, breaking Logan Watson Brown's time of 59.33, set back on May 14, 2016 during the Validus National Championship. Daly would win the 200 meter freestyle silver medal with a time of 208.24, breaking her record of 210.26. She set back on April 1, 2018 during the 33rd Carifta Swimming Championships in Jamaica. Daly captured the bronze medal during the 100 meter backstroke final, clocking 108.32. She would win her final medal which was the brunt in the 200 meter individual medley with a time of 2.30.03. Bermuda's Shaquille Hill has signed a new contract with the Oakville Blue Devils with the club stating online, quote, Hill definitely caught our eye with his performance. The club's announcement went on to say the Oakville Blue Devils have extended an under 20 roster position to Shaquille Hill for the 2018 season. Hill was identified playing against the Blue Devils in the recent Bermuda Triangle Cup in Bermuda during the Blue Devils preseason tour back in April. Yet another Bermuda Basketball Summer League double hatter took place inside the Bermuda College Gymnasium last evening where 227 points were scored. Game 1 saw the Meyer Twisters defeat the Hamilton Parish Rockets 69-51. of Omari Del Pettiford would lead the Twisters with a game high 24 points. He would have 7 rebounds, 2 assists, 1 steal and 1 block shot while Gershon Kirk scored 19 points for the Hamilton Parish Rockets. He also had 14 rebounds, 2 steals and 5 block shots. In Game 2, the Devonshire Chargers would edge the Paget Flyboys 56 to 51. The Bermuda Commercial Softball League season resumed at the Michael Priest Softball Diamond with a triple hatter that produced 106 runs crossing the plate. Sea Venture Mini Meads opened the evening, picking up a 22 7 win over the Butterfield and Valley Sliders. Scared Hitless went down 27 15 to the Hakuna Matata Charters in the second match before Catano Power closed out the night with a 22 13 win over the Beach Bum. I'm Earl Baisden with Bermuda Broadcasting Sports.
Thanks, Earl. And just before we go, a chance to see some of the spectacle put on by the Salvation Army in Pembroke this weekend with the church holding its annual Spring Festival of Music for the 22nd time. There was a march by the divisional band before the show was taken inside where an ensemble of musicians representing four churches played this year's event, featured America guest composer and conductor William Bill Holmes and other visiting guests. Speaking to our Wayne Snappy Astwood, local bandmaster Warren Jones said the primary purpose of the Salvation Army Band is to spread the gospel through music. We serve as the organ of the Salvation Army, and so in any Salvation Army meeting, uh, we provide the music, but we also uh, can operate on our own and present the gospel uh, through our own music. And you are a totally brass band? We are a totally brass band. The Salvation Army traditionally has brass bands. Uh, we play all styles of music, with the Salvation Army being in 120 countries. All of those cultures come together, so within our music, you can find every style that's out there. That's it from us tonight. I'm Diane Brewer. Have a wonderful evening. Good night.